as I promised, going to keep it brief, uh, but I want to today specially mention our co-organizers uh, of this event, uh, American Cinema Editors, or ACE. Yes. Uh, a, a big thank you to ACE. They are an honorary society of film editors founded in 1950, whose members are elected in recognition of their professional achievements and dedication to fostering a culture of excellence in the field of editing. Uh, they approached us with the idea for this panel of just a conversation bringing together editors to delve into the craft, the profession, the art of editing. Uh, in the context of NYFF films. And we were so thrilled when they came to us because we agreed right away that it was uh, a, a necessary uh, uh, occasion that we could uh, foster this kind of conversation. I want to especially shout out to thank ACE members Joseph Krings, Oliver Leaf, and Derek McCants for making this possible. <laughs> And uh, without further ado, I will bring on our moderator to, uh, to introduce our special guests, Sandra Adair, the editor of NYFF Spotlight Selection Hitman, and Jonathan Alberts, the editor of NYFF Main Slate Selection, All of Us Strangers, which hopefully some of you have had a chance to see or, or will see in the next few days. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say too much more. I'm going to let our moderator uh, uh, introduce you more fully to, to these talents. Um, and to that end, we're so happy to be joined by ACE member Jeffrey Wolf as our moderator. Uh, Jeffrey has worked as an editor professionally since 1985 on a wide range of films, television projects, uh, and has also uh, directed a number of films himself, including the documentaries James Castle, Portrait of an Artist, and Bill Trailer, Chasing Ghosts. So without any further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our moderator, Jeffrey Wolf. It's an ace kind of a night. Um, so, welcome, uh, good evening. Tonight, we hope to give you an in-depth conversation with Sandra and Jonathan um, about, the, <clears throat> about the craft and the profession of film editing and the complex ways in which the editor's creative labor comes into contact with the work of the cinematographers, musicians, actors, and others. Sandra and Jonathan, will discuss the films that they've edited that are included in the film festival that, that Maddie just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> so the first one we'll talk about is, um, well, actually, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about The Hitman, but why don't you two come out, and Sandra and Jonathan. I think I'll sit down. Um, so, Hitman, Glenn Powell plays a straight-laced philosophy professor, Gary Johnson, who moonlights as an undercover Hitman for the New Orleans Police Department. Gary begins to descend into morally dubious territory when he finds himself attracted to one of those potential criminals. The film is based on an improbable true story with a few wild embellishments. Now, Netflix wasn't able to provide us with a clip of this film, so, <laughs> so <laughs> we will show you a clip from Before Midnight, another collaboration of Sandra and, and Richard Linkletter. Before Midnight is um, the third in a trilogy following Before Sunrise and Before Sunset. And the, <clears throat> the story is on the last night of their idyllic Greek vacation, longtime lovers Jesse, Ethan Hawke, and Celine, Julie Delpy, reminisce about their lives together and what different choices might have brought. Sandra has said it's her favorite of the three. Maybe she'll tell us why in their conversation. So we're going to show you a clip of that and then talk about it a little bit afterward. I love those films. So. Um, before we get on to Jonathan's clip, I thought it would be fun to start with process and script. That that's something that definitely is part of this, but Jonathan, I'm sure, has a lot to say about that as well. 
Go ahead. That's to you. Okay. Well, <laughs> the thing I love the best about that is when she calls him a closet macho. <laughs> like, who says that? Um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> um, to start with getting the script first and then the okay. process, the beginning of the process. Yeah. The, reading the scripts are always really fun. Every Linklater film that I've ever done with him has been incredibly unique. So he doesn't, he, he makes films that are variously different. And uh, so I'm always surprised when I read a script to have some kind of inkling of where he's headed with the film. Um, I was, we had a conversation earlier today and I, I did say, and I really firmly believe this, that the written page is um, so transformed once it goes through an actor's mind and the, the workshopping, the rehearsals, the, the interaction between the director and the actors, and then the sets that get built and the locations where they shoot and the cinematography, like it just, it isn't a written document anymore. It's suddenly a, an entirely different animal. And so though the script is, are the bones of a movie and especially well-written scripts, um, I feel like that, that an editor shouldn't feel tied to the written word. That's my take. What about you? Well, it's interesting. I think the, uh, my process with Andrew is a little bit different. I mean, I think I usually, we're, we're, we've been working for about 10 years together. So uh, when he, we're busy working on a, on a show, on a television show or a film, he's busy typing in the background and I'm, you know, cutting and what are you working on? And he's like, oh, I'm working on a story and this is what I'm working on. And there's a few things usually happening. And so that's when I first hear about the script. Um, and then, typically, he'll share it with me a few months later. And when I read that script, we have a conversation. We talk about what he wants to do, what his vision for the film is, and you know, thinking about it with all of us strangers. Uh, I think he, you know, he came over. I live in Los Angeles, and he came over, and he, you know, plunked himself down on my on my couch, and we just started talking for a couple hours about what you know his vision for the film was. Um, so once we started shooting. Uh, I'm putting those, you know, I'm putting the film together and generally getting to, I mean, I think for all of us strangers, we shot for about seven weeks. And uh, when we got the, you know, got to the assembly stage where I'd finished the assembly, which is, you know, the first cut of the film, about a week after shooting, um, typically, and I know not all editors are like this, I think it's maybe a little different with you and Richard, but Andrew and I never sit in the same room and watch that cut because you know you've worked so hard. It's like you've spent a lot of time yourself and your assistants putting it together, and you know I think uh, it's a really vulnerable time for a director. It's an extremely vulnerable time, you know, seeing all the problems or seeing all the things they didn't get. And I quite like not being in the room. I think Andrew and I did a film a few years ago, a few years ago called Forty Five Years, and uh, it was the first film we did together. And uh, when I spoke to him, I said, like, do you, how do you want to watch the first cut? He's like, do you want to? And he's like, no, no, I'll watch it like separate. And I was like, okay, great. And uh, after he watched that, he said uh, to me, he's like, well, I didn't cry. So it was like a positive thing. And that's kind of what you hope for with a director because it's, it's a kind of a crazy experience for them. You, you know, both of, both of these films feel like the dialogue's being improvised. And, and we know it's not, but the way they're shot, it feels very much you know like that can you go through like what it's like to go through multiple multiple takes to kind of figure out how to put that you know how to find the right tone and how to build the house of that scene uh, oh it's Sorry easy do, yeah. <laughs> it's easy um <laughs> let's see none of richard's films are um improv they, he writes, they, he, he co-writes with his actors frequently on Hitman, <clears throat> the lead actor, Glenn Powell was a co-writer. And in the Before trilogy, uh, Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy were co-writers on those scripts. And so their process is very, it, it's very 
um, open between the actor and the writer and the director, and they rehearse and rewrite and rehearse and rewrite, and they really discover the characters and, and who those people are gonna be before they ever bring a camera into the room. So, uh, are you that, privy to that, Sandra? Like, do you get to, are you no, involved at all? No, no, I mean, that is something that, that I think I revere Richard for. He, he has this process down with the actors and it's very private. And it, it, he doesn't, it's just what he does. That's his gift. Mm -hmm. And I am not privy to that part of it. And that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. But um, there have been some scenes, like this one that we just saw in Before Midnight, where everybody's talking at once, and you think, oh my god, this is utter chaos. How in the hell am I ever going to make an edit in that when three people are talking at the same time? And in the moment when they're shooting the takes, there's a lot of variance in the takes. Some are. It's pitch, really, is what it is. Some of the takes are very excited, and everybody's kind of raising their voice. Some of the takes are vo more seductive. It's really, um, they deliver, the actors deliver a wide range of choice. And then um, that's where I come in. Like, where, what is the appropriate pitch and tone of the scene at the beginning, the middle, and the end. And how does it, how do, can I make it feel not technical, but realistic as if it's really happening? And that's, you know, that's my job. And um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. No, but Jonathan, you know, we, we talked about the arc of a scene, the arc of a section of the movie, an arc of the entire film. Well, I think my approach is always about, you know, you have to think about the entire film in terms of an arc, in terms of like starting at point A and getting to point B. And, um, and I approach that within acts of the film and I approach that within scenes because every scene has to have an event. Every scene has to have a reason why it exists. So, you know, if, if it doesn't have a reason, then why is it there? And so in terms of starting, you know, when you're cutting a scene, it's always finding, for me, it's finding not just the dialogue, but it's finding the subtext. It's, you know, ideally, a good films for me always have text and they always have subtext. They have a dialogue and everything that's you know, beyond the dialogue. And oftentimes, you're crafting a scene to find those moments. I mean, you, know, you can do experiments, and I'm sure you've done them before, where you start pulling dialogue away. And you can do that when you have a performance that doesn't work. Um, but you can do that as well when you have performances, great performances. Like in All of Us Strangers, we had a great group of actors. And, when you start pulling dialogue out and you start to do things with looks and you start to do things, it feels, you know, that's all the subtext that basically is telling the audience what's going on, whether it's body language, um, looks between characters and that kind of a thing. So I'm always thinking about the text and the subtext because uh, the subtext is always a bit more interesting. And I think the clip that I have is a bit about, you know, it's with Claire Foy, which I think is a good way to talk about performance. Um, why don't we talk about that then? Sure, yeah. <laughs> so um, All of Us Strangers is an expertly modulated, emotionally overwhelming love story suspended in a metaphysical realm. Adam played, by Adam, Scott, um, Adam, played by Andrew Scott, plays a melancholy screenwriter living alone who meets and begins a passionate relationship with the more extroverted Harry, played by Paul Mescal. At the same time, Adam begins another parallel journey to confront his troubled past and perhaps reconcile his unsettled present. All of Us Strangers is uncommonly perceptive about the desires, fears, and traumas of a specific generation of gay men and its depiction of familial love and its estrangement. So why don't we look at the clip? And just to set the yeah. clip up for a second, sure. because it's a little, I don't know if anybody, has anybody seen the movie? Okay, okay. so a group of people have seen it. So I think, just for the people that haven't seen it, I think this is Adam coming back to his, the, his childhood home, and uh, his mother's, you know, basically a ghost. So it's the first, it's the second meeting he's had with her, and when he arrives, it's uh, no spoilers. 
<laughs> no, it's him stepping into it. But I think if you don't know that, you kind of, you'll see. This is a film that really catches you by surprise. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, I think what's interesting and why I chose this clip, because it's not, you know, a particularly flashy clip. It's not, I mean, there's sequences in the film that are, you know, much more exciting in terms of cuts and, and things like that. But I think what often doesn't get it talked about is just the difficulty in cutting dialogue scenes. And how dialogue is oftentimes much more difficult to cut than action. Action scenes are oftentimes quite blocked out. They're very, you know, um, storyboarded. And there's so much going on with the dialogue, as I was saying before, in terms of the nuance. And, you know, thinking about Claire's performance, I mean, there's so much going on in her eyes. And when you have, you know, two great actors, when you have four great actors in the film, it's that nuance is, you see that in four or five takes. You see that in all the takes that you're getting. I mean, it's not like, oh, that's the best performance of, of that setup. I mean, you're getting a lot of good stuff, and it's always a question of, well, you don't just put all the best stuff in. You're actually, you know, really calibrating performance, even for, for great actors. So it's pretty interesting with, you know, the choices that we had to make between Andrew inhabiting this world where he was kind of a child again with his mother, and Claire being a mother to, to a boy that is now, you know, 35 years older. So there's this kind of, there's a lot going on. I think for me, it's what good performances is basically when actors are doing more than one thing. And I worked with a, a director, you know, quite a while ago, and I remember she was talking to an actor and she was saying like, you know, you know, or the actor was saying to her rather, and he's saying, do I, you know, do you want me to, you know, do you want me to feel more guilty in this scene? It was kind of like, a, it was an interrogation scene, but not like a police interrogation scene. And she's like, do you want me to be more guilty? Should I be more culpable? Should I be like, feel more innocent? She's like, I want you to do all of those things. And it's kind of the key, I think, with acting is that it's not about one emotion. There's so much going on on the textual level, on the subtextual level, but also within the performance as a whole. And that's what I think makes performance a really interesting thing to cut, is those choices become so much about, you know, so much about character and so much about how you're feeling, um, how those characters are operating within the scene, within the whole, so. I, I mean, editing is a learned craft in some ways, but we were talking a lot about a feel, a feel for the scene and a knowing when you go in to cut a scene. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, um, just like Jonathan said, Every scene is in the movie for a reason. And it's doing some work to tell the story of the whole. And so I try to always figure out, like, what is this scene doing for the film? What's it doing for the audience? And what is it doing for the characters? What is, and I know this word is a kind of a trigger word, but what is the intent of this scene and how is it going to, operate overall. And one of the things I agree about cutting dialogue, I've cut a lot of dialogue films in my life because that's kind of what Richard does. I learned very early on that when you cut to a reaction shot of an actor and the words that the person who is speaking is not on camera but the words are falling on the expression of the other actor it takes on a whole new meaning than if you're just sitting there watching someone talk. And so the selection of exactly what piece in a reaction shot, it's very nuanced. Just like Jonathan said, you're looking for something that connects the two characters, or three or eight in that case. And what is it that's going to draw emotion whatever emotion you're trying to create. And a lot of times, it's reaction shots. And um, I don't know, it's, we manipulate performance. Performances are delivered in the most immaculate way. They're, you know, we have both worth, worked with some of the finest actors in the business. But still, you can't just lay down a take and say, OK, that's awesome. You, you've got, there's so many things that are going through your mind as an editor when you're cutting a scene. You're thinking about how close should you be? How far away should you be? Who should be talking? Who should be listening? Should it all be listening? 
should I even cut? Like maybe I don't even need to make an edit. It's there, you know, what is the lighting? Is there a shadow? Is there a microphone hanging down in the shot? There's so, so a lot of things that go through your mind that you're, for me, I yeah, can only yeah. speak for me, but I'm calculating and I watch takes over and over and over again. And each time I watch, I'm, I'm looking at different things, um, including, and I hate to say this, continuity. Um, so there's a lot of times the lines, the timing can get kind of, uh, the timing isn't just right on something. And so you realize, well, look, if I just take out this pause and pull it under, it's going to feel better. And I think sometimes with that, it's, you know, I think you learn that, I think, over the course of your career in terms of, like, there is an instinct to it, but it is a learned craft, and editing is the kind of thing where early on in, you know, my career was, you know, I was scared to death sometimes of, like, trying to understand and figure out a structure of a film or how something was working, and I think it's... It's a thing, the more you do, the more you kind of understand it and can instinctually feel of those things. But it's, um, it is a, it's a strange thing because there are so many, um, look, there's so many options. When you, when you have a scene like your scene, you said was that three minute clip we saw, it was a 17 minute scene. So it's a massive kind of thing that you have to break down into small parts. And for all of us strangers, we were cutting we basically were cutting for 14 months total. So that's like, that's a lot of time for, you know, what's an hour and 45 minutes on the screen. And I think a lot of what editing is, is exploring all the possibilities. And you're exploring all those possibilities with all the variables that you have. And that's all the performance that you have. You have, you can choose any music you want in the world. You can choose any kind of sound design. You have, you know, the wealth of, of choosing anything. And so much of it, I think, too, is about taste and about coming into the editing room with Andrew, the director of All of Us Strangers, and us talking about different things, sharing different playlists of music in terms of what he was writing with, what I was thinking about. When we were shooting, I was editing on set, and I was listening to this Italian composer the entire time, which we ended up using for a temporary soundtrack before the composer came in. And a lot of that was you know, just feeling inspired by, inspired by it and sharing it with him. And so much of it is like you bring things in from your own life, and things that are going on, you know, the successes and failures you have in, 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 around you, and you, you use those. And I think so often people think a film is like, oh, it just becomes clear. It's like you cut it and you cut it down and you trim this off and you take that out and suddenly it just reveals itself. When I kind of feel like you wrestle it to the ground and you make it look as simple as possible. And not simplistic, but you want it to feel easy, but it's something that you really, I mean, you struggle with, and we struggled with over 14 months in terms of getting tonally those things right. And, uh, you know, it's just something that uh, it is a craft you learn over your lifetime. Um, I mean, we kind of passed it, but I, I did want to, there's a phrase, having an ear for dialogue. And, and I think that that phrase is somewhat, you, you were born with it, and you learn it as you go along. But, um, you know, that's very much the case in, in both of these films in terms of, um, of that. And now you, were, you start to talk about music. So very different kind of music in these two films, Hitman and, and All of Us Strangers. Um, Hitman is a very interesting score, I think, because it, um, it, it starts kind of happy and then it kind of gets dramatic and then it gets kind of happy again. So tell us how you got to that. Okay, yeah. Um. So we have a composer in Austin, Texas, where I live and work with Richard uh, Graham Reynolds, and he has scored several of Richard's films, and he's a wonderful, wonderful collaborator. And the film is set in New Orleans, and so we had uh, hundreds of Louisiana songs to select from. And so we wanted to instill the character of New Orleans with the music, but the score does a lot of heavy lifting as well because it, the film has a lot of, I guess nobody here has seen Hitman yet, right? Oh, one person. Oh, a few, okay. Um, the film 
it has a lot of twists and turns. It's very unexpected. And so the score kind of helps uh, support what, what's happening in the scenes without kind of directing your emotion. Like it doesn't really do too much to, uh, it doesn't overdo it. So the selection of the songs was really fun. Uh, when they wrapped, all of the crew members made a Spotify list of their favorite Louisiana m music. So there was a Spotify list with like 250 or 300 Louisiana songs. And then one of the actors, Austin Emilio, gave a huge playlist to Rick. And then a friend of mine who grew up in New Orleans gave me a big playlist. So at the in the end, we had like 500 songs to select from. And we only used a handful. And then the rest of it is, is score. And Graham, um, you know, he went off on in the wrong direction. We had to pull him back a little bit. And really, it's just a series of he would give us a draft. We'd, I'd cut it in. We'd listen to it, talk about it, maybe move it around a little bit. And then we'd talk about the instrumentation and um, what we felt needed to happen with the, with the score. And it really is just a back and forth, back and forth with, uh, with him. One of the interesting things in All of Us Strangers was, um, I think I mentioned to you this morning that I heard some music and all of a sudden I thought, was that playing the whole time? Or, mm. or was I just hearing it now for the first time? Yeah, I think it's a lot. In the films that I work on with Andrew, uh, in terms of the score, like not the pop songs that come in, but just the score, I mean, he, wa he always wants them to appear kind of unknowingly and disappear unknowingly. And, you know, the idea is always to be, it's always about being quite subtle with things and always um, having music that supports a scene and underscores it, but never makes itself too known. And it's, it's for this film, it was very, it was such a specific thing because of the tone of the film. It's not just a straight ahead drama that, there are kind of, in a way, supernatural elements, but we never wanted it to be move into genre. We always wanted to keep it in a very subtle space. And it's a very delicate line, and I think music certainly is something that, you know, helps to draw that out. I mean, you put on the wrong music, and we tried a lot of different things before we'd actually gotten to the um, stage of hiring a composer. And we tried a lot of different things. And, a lot of different screenings for the studio and a lot of different conversations about music and a lot of different notes about what was working and what's not working and this is always as sandra said it's this back and forth dialogue that you know everybody has an opinion about what's good music i mean if they don't know what is good editing they know what they like in music and it's <laughs> and you always hear about it and you're constantly hearing about it from studio executives and you know, and when you have screenings for, for different people to kind of test out the film. And it's such an odd experience because as editors, you work so hard putting that score together. Um, as I said, when I was, when we were shooting this film, I was we shot it in London and we were shooting on the stage for Adam's apartment. And uh, I would take the tube and the train in every day and I was uh, listening to this Italian composer, Caterina Barbieri, which we ended up using as temp for the, and for the temporary soundtrack before we hired the composer. And she's an amazing composer. And we met with her and we thought about her doing the score. But eventually we kind of went in a different direction. But that evolved over several months and many discussions. So everything that kind of ends up, it becomes like such a talking point, I suppose. But, but in that movie, it became very important because it kept reminding you that we were in some sort of supernatural. Yeah, situation. and I mean, that's what, you know, music does. I mean, it's that kind of thing where it's like, certain music hitting certain tropes. I mean, we never wanted to feel like it was genre or any kind of horror thing, but we knew there were like kind of these traumatic elements and music all reminds us of, reminds us of certain things based on <coughs> instrumentation, based on the rhythm, based on where they're placed, with what picture, and that is a constant negotiation in the cutting room. Constantly you're talking about that, going back and forth with the director, and you know, as I said, with all the other voices that are end up being in the room. So. It's why it oftentimes takes a long time, but it's, it's, it's a fun process as well, I mean. Before we take questions, I, we, we had a little conversation about in, kind of inside baseball, about how you solve a problem on a, on a, that you might have in a given scene or a scene that you've worked on weeks before or weeks, at, you know, that like 
where's that safe place that you go to figure out, but you know, where it comes to you, you know, like, oh, that, that's what I should do. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. I think it's, the creative process is one which is complicated and for any of you that's, you know, created anything, whether it's writing an essay, I mean, that's, it's, it's a weird process of whittling things down, moving things around, and I think problems always come up in the cutting room where you don't know how to solve them. Sometimes it's structural in terms of the placement of the scenes, sometimes it's within a scene, sometimes it's a performance, and for me, it's like what I always find is that, you know, when I go out for a run or I do something, I'm, my mind is not on the problem. Sometimes you can solve it in the cutting room, but sometimes you need to like get away from it. You like, if I'll go for a run and I'm like looking at, you know, you, your mind is totally detached from it. Whether that it's that or in the shower or somewhere else, it's like I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, oh, you know what? I think there's an idea for a piece of music if it came in later, if it was there, and then. You know, and I take that stuff to the cutting room because it's the kind of thing where I think you almost have to be slightly detached from the problem in order to get a kind of bird's eye view for it. So for me, it's, it's kind of where it ends up. It, I agree 100%. Like the shower, things dawn on me in the shower and, I, and sometimes I even forget what the thought that I had. I also play a trick with myself, which is to take the to take the onus off of just playing around. And I will make a duplicate of a sequence and I'll write experiment. So it's like, okay, nobody's judging this. I'm not judging it, Rick's not judging it, nobody's judging it, I'm just gonna play. And that somehow tricks me into being, releasing the, any constraints that I have. Also, um, I'll, I listen to a lot of music in my car while I drive to work, and sometimes I will hear the most random song in the world, and I will be like, oh my God, that would work so good in the funeral scene in Last Flag Flying. That's like the perfect song. And I like drive 90 miles an hour to the cutting room, <laughs> step on the gas, get in there, tell my assistant, can you get that song and put it in and by God, it works. And it's like, if that hadn't come on the radio, it never ever would have occurred to me. But I think, that's, that's, I think it's too what's what, what editing is all about and I think editors often get short shrift about their contribution and how it, how it works within that. But you take things from your life and you put them in there and you kind of understand that, you know, it's a very personal process because editing is a completely subjective craft and it's one that, you know, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's, it's not divorced from, you know, just this kind of monolithic like filmmaking and it's just, the script is there. It's, it's I don't know, it, it's a very misunderstood and it's a very hard thing to explain, I find. And when you live with a film, as long as Jonathan has 14 months or with me, um, Hitman, seven months, and you're so immersed in all of the detail and all of the big picture, you, it's just in there, it's in your subconscious. You can't ignore that it's permeated your whole being, really. And you can't get rid of it, either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think we'll open up the questions. Jonathan was curious, one second. It, it, could you raise your hand if, you, if you're an editor? or aspiring, that's good. Uh, sir. I don't know what the rules are, if they are, if they exist. I think every project is so different. You just can't, you just can't go by the rules. Those mug shots, there were a lot of iterations of how we ended up using those mug shots and um, when we did, here's a, just a little anecdote. When we did um, Dazed and Confused, which was 30 years ago, we went through a very rigorous preview process. Like, just we were out in California, a million screenings and notes from the studio and feedback from the audience and then another screening over and over again. And Rick and I were like, you know, they just want it faster, funnier, and stupider. <laughs> and, and, and he and I 
you know, we would we'd make this hand gesture of like, they just, they just want, <laughs> like that's, you know, and so we still make that joke with each other because obviously you want the film to be paced correctly, you want the jokes to land, but every joke is different. So I don't know what the rules are. It's really, it, I don't know. William Goldman, <laughs> William Goldman says make it 10% funnier. So. <laughs> Uh, do you have a, Do you get chances to work on documentaries, and if so, are they vastly different to cut? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll just, yeah. So I started working in documentary when I was living in New York uh, in the late '90s, and that's kind of how I got into editing. And uh, documentary is a whole different thing, <laughs> in a way. I mean, it's still story, but I think you spend so much time in a documentary just writing the story. Um, but I love documentary, and I think documentary is amazing. And I think it was actually like very fertile ground to to learn how to edit because you learn in a very different way, and it's just it's um, it's rigorous. I think rigorous, and I mean, look, working on a film for 14 months that's scripted is is definitely rigorous as well. But it's a different kind of rigor, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, documentaries are very they use a different part of your brain in an entirely different way. When you have a narrative script and actors, it's so different than when you have footage that's, it could be, you know, hours, hundreds of hours of footage shot over years. And the editor's job is to find the right pieces to tell a story in a very short amount of time. It's very, very different. I actually directed a documentary and edited it myself. And, oh boy, I'm telling you, I, it was so difficult. And, and I kept thinking, I brought this on myself. I don't know why I did that, but it, the editing part of it and, the, and telling the story and shooting it and doing the interviews, I finally realized no one is gonna do this except me. So get in there and don't make a bad film. And it just kind of, it, it came together. I'm really, really proud of it. But it, it's it's entirely different animal than narrative. Hello, um, my name is Maya and I'm an actor and I just want to say thank you so much to Sandra and Jonathan. Um, I watch a lot of films and I really appreciate what editors do. And I just want to know what is the um, the most important process of making a choice in the process of looking at something repetitively, and then also talking to the director, who is important in terms of persuading them to make that choice as well in the final cut of the film. Okay, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> Making choices are, and I know a lot of editors probably say this, it's very instinctual, and it's very gut-driven, and if, if you select a piece and you put it in the movie juxtaposed to the shot in front and the shot in back, and it seems to flow and work, you're likely to stick with it. If you put it in there and it feels like you're taking a left turn somewhere, you have to try again. And so there's a certain amount of being tenacious about something, about being just absolutely not giving up. Um, the director, uh, if, if there is a disagreement about whether or not something works or not, timing is everything when to talk to a director. You know what I mean? Like you don't, if they walk in the room and you can tell they're agitated, it's probably not the best time to bring it up. <laughs> so you just wait until the time is right and there's a vibe that feels open. He said, by the way, I wanted to talk to you about this. What about, check out my experiment. You know, it's, you just have to. It's often showing and not telling because yes. if you just say it's wrong, it's like, well, how about something like this? 
you create a lot of new ideas that way. Yeah. I mean, that's like a way in which it's like, well, this is what I was kind of workshopping this, you know, after hours and you show them something. I mean, even if it's not right, it sparks these other, other ideas. 100%. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a very, sh it's a, it's a much more of a show and not tell and kind of. Yeah, experience. I like to give the director options, like option A, B, and C. So I'll cut something three ways and I'll know what my favorite is and I'll usually color it green for go. <laughs> and, um, and I will say, you know, how about this? Or also, I have, you know, two other options, and then, and then it'll spark a conversation. And, yeah. and I think, too, it's often like, if you bring a non-editor in the room and you say, like, okay, here's, like, you know, three hours of footage for, like, you know, a 10-minute scene, it's a bit like, the first question is, like, well, where do you start? Like, how do you do it? Like, what, you know, it's not about how you do it, but it's actually like, how do you make the choices? And again, it's experience of actually just sitting down and doing it. And you have to just start somewhere. So it's not like you just start laying shots down and feeling like, oh, okay, it's like, you know, um, you know, I know exactly what the order is going to be, or I know exactly where I'm going to start. Like, it's a process of like this discovery. And that's what's kind of amazing about editing is that you have this like whole moments of like, oh, like I'm taking the scene in this direction and based on performance and all these variables and there's so many permutations of that that it becomes one of just choice, you know? Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, I guess my question is, sort of a personal one in a sense uh, because uh, like you you spend so much time with the movie you spend so much time working on it calibrating it and it changes its form throughout that process uh, when do you or how do you uh, process that it's over now or like you're you're done with it now it's more about uh, my question is more about how you, how do you let it go then, you know, a lot of times I hear that you have to let it go at some point of time. And so, how do you, how do you, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a really good question because I think in the creative process with any kind of art form, it is a question of, you know, when you let it go or people say, you know, you just abandon it at some point. And it's a difficult one. And I think oftentimes there are, I mean, when you're working on a film, depending on what kind of film it is, there are financial restrictions. There are different kind of restrictions that tell you you're going to be letting it go. Um, but you know, artistically, it's it's tough. I mean, cutting all of a stranger for 14 months is a long time to cut a film, and uh, a lot of, a lot of time to cut a film that is this kind of a film. And I think we struggled with that for sure, and we. You know, we had a producer that would come in, and you know, I think I, I mentioned this last night at the Q and A, but he would come in and he said, "Like, it's beautiful. Keep going." And you know, I know when we started shooting in June of 2022, we had our first kind of small screening at uh, in November. I mean, it's essentially the same film, but it's but it's also 20 minutes shorter, and it's not just you know in terms of length, but it is a different film, even though it's telling the same story and. It's just, it's a struggle, and it's one that I think we have a constant dialogue about, saying like, are we done? Watch it again. What, you know, we'd sit there, Andrew and I would often sit there and be like, toward what we knew was feeling like the end. We'd sit there and we'd be like, okay, let's watch it, and just say like, is there anything, like what is actually bothering you? Like, is there anything that you've just, we haven't addressed? And it's a very open conversation, but it's difficult, because you go away for two days and suddenly you think of something else, so. A lot of times you just run out of time. You yeah. run out of budget, you Pencils run out of time, down. and yeah, there's a festival submission, and you know, that's, there's that. Um, I like yeah. that expression, we never finish it, we just abandon yeah. it. <laughs> another, another thing about, about the process, which I think it's a beautiful part of the process, is having um, preview screenings and getting feedback well, it, the minute you have one single other person unrelated to the film in the room to watch the film, it alters your perception. It completely makes you paranoid and you think you've done a horrible job and what are they gonna do, walk out in the middle? You just don't know. And it, it, it heightens, it, it makes you hypersensitive to uh, what's on the screen and how it's playing and whether or not the jokes are landing or the drama is as heavy as it needs to be. 
And so I, I find that screening it for my assistant, I bring my assistants in a lot to watch cuts. Um, I'll bring uh, Rick's assistant in to watch cuts. And, and then we have like actual audience screenings, anywhere from six people, friends and family, to you know, 50 people in a theater or 80 people. And you, you know what is working and what's not, I think. Does anybody have, we only have time for one or two, but does any, anybody have a specific question about either of these two movies? Okay, if not, go ahead. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of talk about how editing is a craft that you learn through doing uh, over and over again. But I'm curious if uh, either of you have any um, uh, personal idols uh, or work that inspire you as an editor. Do you have edi other editors as your, your idol or whose work technique inspire you? I mean, for me, it's interesting because I think much of that for me came as like from mentors that I had when I was, you know, first starting who encouraged me to edit and, you know, were looking at things that I was cutting. Um, and one of mine was a documentary editor that I worked with in New York here. His name is Jonathan Oppenheim, who's passed away. But he did a lot of amazing films, Paris is Burning, Children Underground, mm -hmm. Arguing the World. Like, he's, he's, he did amazing stuff. And he was the first editor I worked with, and it was just an absolute you know, education in, in not only how to be in a cutting room, but how to think and talk about film, so. Oftentimes, I mean, and it's that within a scene, within, you know, an act within the entire thing, because you remove a scene and suddenly a performance or a, you know, some kind of beat changes. I mean, it always does that. And, I think that's the real difficulty in trying to understand, and that's kind of the lesson as editors you're always learning, and every film is different. So you can kind of learn from other films, but you can't necessarily like apply that solution to um, other films that you come across, but it always is the case where it's like, oh, why did they feel differently? People will come into the room and they'll be like, oh, I really like what you did with like the performance here. It's like, we didn't touch that, but you touched everything around it. And all the time that'll happen, happen with directors, it'll happen with studio executives, I mean, and it's just the way it is. I, I think we have a hard out at 7.30, so um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, check, out, check out the America Cinema Editors online, and thanks, Sandra. And thank, you. thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.